So I'm here to talk about entrepreneurship. A um, little, just a few, few minutes about me. Um, I'm really kind of a nomadic seeker in a lot of ways. Um, I was a heavy metal guitar player and a metalsmith and a jewelry maker and then a real estate agent and a bunch of other things in between there. <laughs> and for a while, I was a heavy metal guitar playing metalsmith and real estate agent all at the same time. So that didn't work out too well. Um, I went on to become a dating guru, a teacher of entrepreneurship, uh, an investor in technology companies. Um, so I have a, a kind of broad range of experiences that I'm bringing here as I talk about these um, patterns that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I've been teaching entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship now for about eight years formally. Um, taught tens of thousands of entrepreneurs all around the world uh, in topics like creativity and productivity and product and marketing and growing businesses. Uh, I've built 10 brands and businesses over a million dollars, four of them over $10 million myself in my own world. Uh, I've invested in slash advised uh, four or five companies over the last seven years or so. Uh, so far, all of them are successful in growing, so knock on wood. Um, so. As I, uh, as I went to work studying entrepreneurship and kind of the, the code, um, I feel like, I've, um, feel like I've recognized some patterns that, uh, that really make sense to me and make sense to a lot of other folks. And I guess, you know, really, um, like a lot of folks that do this kind of thing, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a hacker, I'm a meta learner, I'm someone who's trying to find the meta patterns behind uh, what helps us achieve and create the results that we want in our lives. One of the observations that I have is that I think that entrepreneurs are really the superheroes of the future, and that's who they're becoming. Um, if you even look at you know, the movies, if you look at Tony Stark, who's you know, Iron Man, who's an old comic book character, there's a whole side of his identity that's an entrepreneur, and most people know that in a lot of ways um, he was modeled on Elon Musk. And if you look at people like Mark Zuckerberg and the Google guys and some of these other you know, young people that are starting businesses and then selling them, all of a sudden young people today are looking away from you know, cultural icons and sex symbols and things and they're looking at entrepreneurship and saying, that is what I want to be. And so I think that in the future, um, as entrepreneurs, we're going to become uh, role models and real figureheads for you know, a new movement. And we have to start thinking that way. We have to start behaving like role models and realizing that what we do, other people will uh, imitate and they'll follow. Another thing about entrepreneurship is that the entrepreneur path to success, um, essentially striking out on your own and starting a new thing, it's, rel it's still relatively new in the zeitgeist. For most of us, it's kind of the way things are, but for the rest of the world, it's still a new idea and it's still a relatively new word. Okay? There, some people in this room, if you said, you know, what do you do at a party, they will say, I'm an entrepreneur. But most people who are entrepreneurs still wouldn't answer, I'm an entrepreneur. Most people still don't identify as an entrepreneur. Right? So again, for us, it's kind of normal, but for the rest of the world, and so many people who are potential entrepreneurs, um, it, it still isn't, um, it's not a potential path for them. It's not a word that they use. It's not a, a self-image that they have. And so I just want to recommend that we use the word entrepreneur and we keep using that word um, because it's, you know, it's normal to us, but it's new for most people. A few definitions of entrepreneurship. Uh, I've learned from Ken Wilber, multiple definitions uh, are useful to have. So anytime you have an important concept, look for at least three to five definitions, you know, seven or more if you really want to get, you know, a faceted kind of multidimensional uh, idea for something. Okay, so the word entrepreneur is a French word, uh, originally meant to undertake something. Okay, so entrepreneur, more literal inter in, in uh, interpretation was to undertake. Um, then it became used to describe someone that was a, a manager of a business, kind of like a you know general manager of a business, and uh, and only then uh, did it. Uh, Jean Baptiste say he he had a definition which I'm paraphrasing here, which is an entrepreneur is someone that takes resources from a lower level of productivity, 
to a higher level of productivity. That's kind of in essence. And my simple definition of an entrepreneur is someone who builds a profitable business. A lot of people have started businesses and they consider themselves to be entrepreneurial, but none of them ever went anywhere. So I can't really give someone the rubber stamp that you're a successful entrepreneur until you've launched a business and it makes profit, which would be defined as producing more value than it consumes. And traditionally up to this point, that's been measured in money. And I think we're becoming more sophisticated now as humans and just in, in a lot of ways starting to think of this uh, in a, a more evolved way. But that skill of building a business that produces more value than it consumes, when you can do that, especially after you do it two or three times, you learn embodied, you know, kind of imprinted lessons that make you so much more powerful, orders of magnitude more powerful, when you then come back and want to uh, contribute and make a difference. So I said uh, produce more value than consume. Uh, so an important question that I recommend that we all ask ourselves is what is value? Right. What is value? I think that's one of those ones that's worth writing on a little post-it and putting on your, you know, your monitor or putting next to your desk and just thinking about for a few months. What is value? And really asking your customers, asking your partners, asking other people around you. And if you say what is value, that maybe is a little too abstract. But just asking, what is your biggest fear or frustration? Or what worries you? What is your biggest desire? What's the outcome? You know, how would things look if they were perfect for you? And just really tuning into what are people afraid of? What are they fearing and worrying about? And what do they desire? And we can never ask, and in my experience so far, we can never ask those questions too much. They, they're never, they never get old. We can ask our partners, we can ask our families, we can ask our customers, we can ask the people we work with, and we can keep doing it for years and decades and just get deeper, more profound answers. So what is value? I asked uh, my good friend and mentor, Wyatt Woodsmall, this question when I was, you know, several years ago when I was really trying to wrap my brain around value itself and incentives. And he said, uh, well, Eben, <laughs> if you know Wyatt, that's a pretty good interpretation. Uh, he said, well, Eben, um, value is a nominalization. It's an abstract noun. It's basically a process of, to value something that's been then turned into this frozen static thing. So what we have to do, what you do in neurolinguistic programming is you denominalize it. So you take this word value, which again is a kind of frozen, dead, abstract noun, and you turn it back into a process. So you ask, what does it mean to value something? And so when I, when I say, what is value, what we're really asking ourselves is what is, the process, is, what is the process that human beings go through to apply value to something, for it to become something that they want or something they want to avoid? And then how do they have those experiences physically, emotionally, psychologically? And getting inside of that world and really empathizing with another person, again, it, it creates a lot of insight that you can use in your business, um, but it's also great practice for um, building relationship with other human beings. One of the more important uh, fundamentals that I've learned in terms of succeeding as an entrepreneur is what I call the critical counterintuitive. And the essence is that the next step on our path to success in entrepreneurship, but also anywhere else in life, is usually not obvious, and it's often counterintuitive, meaning it's counter to what we would intuitively or naturally do in that situation. When I was younger, I remember going to the carnival uh, with a, a girlfriend, and they had this game, and you know the carnival games, and the, there's always a trick to them. It looks so easy, and then you try to throw the ball or play it, and you can't make it happen. Well, this was a, a game, and it, it, was, it looked pretty simple. It had this spiral of wire that was maybe a foot tall, and it was maybe coiled five times, and then it had this little loop of wire, and then these two handles on it, Anyone seen this game know what I'm talking about? Okay, so the objective is you take the two handles and it's got a circle in the middle like a loop and you have to run this loop down and around this coil of wire without touching the edges. And if the, the, two, if the metal touches, it goes bzzz and you lose. And so you watch the carny behind the thing just with one hand just go down the loop and then get to the bottom and touch the bottom and then win. And you say, oh, I could do that. And then you give them your whatever, five or 10 bucks and you go all the way down to the bottom and then you get mixed up and you go and 
you get that feeling of I just, you know, got taken. Well, being a glutton for punishment, you know, I stood there for hours and I just watched them do it and I watched people lose their money and I watched them do it. And what I realized was that at the end is you've got this thing with these two handles and you're going all the way to the end. There's a, it's a little more complex, but there's a little thing attached to it. And you, everyone turns it one direction when they get to the bottom. It's the intuitive way to turn this thing to go, but it turns out when you turn it the intuitive way, you get stuck and it traps you and you lose the game. And so what you have to do when you get to the bottom is you have to turn it this counterintuitive way. You have to go the opposite way that would make sense. And so I just stood there watching it and then closing my eyes and imagine doing it. And then I gave him my five bucks again and I won because I realized that there was a trick to it. There was something that I had to do that wasn't intuitive. Uh, in my late 20s, um, after having a very challenging and frustrating life with the opposite sex, um, you know, girls didn't like, that's my wife laughing, interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, it's called the laugh of unconscious agreement. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I finally decided, okay, you know, girls didn't talk to me in high school or middle school, and I never got notes, and I never had a girlfriend. And so finally, in my late 20s, I decided, okay, I'm going to figure this thing out. And I read all the books, and I went to all the seminar, like, you know, I really geeked out on this for a couple of years. And the big breakthrough came was when I made friends with guys who were really just naturally good at a, attracting women. And this was a, an interesting group. I mean, I had a next door neighbor who was a stockbroker, this young guy, and I had a, another friend who was, you know, an ex biker, you know, shaman. And I had another friend who was a kind of international playboy guy. But what they all had in common was they just got this chemistry thing with women. And I started watching what they did. And I'm the kind of guy that would literally go to the bar with them and I've got my journal and I would stand there and listen to them and then stop them, you know, and say to her like, he just made fun of you. Now, why are you laughing and giving him your number, you know? And after several months of that and taking a lot of notes, I, you know, I had this epiphany basically that, you know, I summarize as attraction isn't a choice. And when I went through my dating guru phase, this uh, even wrote a book uh, by the title, but I realized that what these guys were doing was stuff I wouldn't have thought of in a million years. They were saying things that would never have occurred to me to say to someone that I was interested in or attracted to, but this counterintuitive stuff was working. I tried many different businesses um, that didn't work out. And then when I finally uh, launched my business and I grew it, I realized that this pattern, it carried over that the things that worked, they weren't things that I would intuitively do. Um, you know, at first our website was one page and all you could do was buy our product. Well then, um, the guy that kind of taught me how to do this originally, we put up a landing page where you couldn't come into the website unless you first opted in. Now, 80% of people that came to the website didn't opt in. So we lost 80% of our audience and at first, I mean, that seems, ridiculous. Why would you just kick 80% of the people out? Well, it turned out that by doing that, we probably 10 x our business because we were able to build a list and then build a series of autoresponders that was hundreds deep and optimize the follow-up. So there are a lot of counterintuitive things that we need to do to succeed as uh, entrepreneurs and as investors, and we have to remember that. Now, I'm a passionate advocate for individuals. Okay, It's becoming... Um, it's, it's really becoming trendy and important for us to think of the collective and the community and think of all of us. Um, but I tend to be passionate about individuals because I don't want the importance of individuals and individuality to get lost in that. I don't want us to get forgotten. Um, powerful groups, um, powerful families are made up of powerful individuals. If you have a bunch of weak individuals and they become a collective, you've got a weak collective. Um, and, and you'll, you'll hear, I mean, you know, Matthew was just up here saying, you know, when we got started, we wanted to make some money and then what happened, right? They became powerful. They got their needs met. And then if you just look around at what's happening here, the collectivization movement that they're now creating, um, there's something to it. You know, there's an, there's an electric energy here that wouldn't be had they decided to do this as the first thing. Yeah. So I think of entrepreneurship as being like an ultimate training ground, 
an ultimate practice place to learn the basic skills that we need to learn in order to then come back and, uh, and be great at contribution. Stephen Covey has the model of first we start out dependent and then be, we become independent and then we become interdependent. And in developmental models, uh, if you study developmental psychology, which I rec recommend you do, in any of the developmental models, each level acts as a foundation for the next level. So if we don't become powerfully independent, we can't become powerfully interdependent. And I think of entrepreneurship as being the best school now for becoming powerfully uh, independent. Robert Kiyosaki, uh, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Cash Flow Quadrant, and some other books that are excellent initial uh, training, you know, he's got this, um, this model where he says, we start out as employee, and then we go to self-employed, and then we become business owners, and then we become investors, and then I would add, then we become philanthropists, ideally. We become people that come back and contribute. And these build upon each other. Okay, so when you're an employee, you are, you know, you learn some tasks, some skills, you do them, you get a paycheck. When you become self-employed, now you're responsible, you have to go get the business as well. Then when you have a, when you're a business owner, you create that organism or that entity that then runs and throws off the profit. And then when you become an investor, you invest in those types of entities. And then ideally when you become a philanthropist or someone that's contributing, you start investing in the most important you know, biggest, widest scale uh, kind of projects. And I say that model, those five steps, because entrepreneur, business owner is in the middle. And what I want to emphasize is that entrepreneurship and owning and building a business, it's one step in a much bigger puzzle. It's not the end. And unfortunately, I see a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck at that step. They get to that level and they start becoming very successful and then they just want more and bigger and you know more money and more power rather than realizing oh that's just one step that I need to become competent in so that I can go on to the next level and go on to the next level so what's the difference between these levels well essentially the difference is each one becomes more complex and more multi-dimensional and has a longer time horizon right so when you're an employee you're just doing your work to get your paycheck in two weeks when you're self-employed, all of a sudden the time horizon moves out and you learn about invoicing and you learn that companies don't pay invoices as fast as you used to get your paycheck. And then when you become a business owner, an entrepreneur, you know, kind of proper, you start thinking in time frames of months and, and years in terms of return. You become an investor, you start thinking in terms of multiple years or even decades. And then philanthropist, you know, you look way out onto the horizon. And, uh, and I say this because because each level builds on the previous levels, this entrepreneur level where you, you start learning to manage a team, to manage resources, to think in multi-year time horizons, it's a really important step for us to all go through. And when I hear people tell me that they want to make a, an impact on the world and they go straight from you know, high school to that or sometimes straight from college to that and they don't get a little experience working in the entrepreneurial world, my heart sinks a little bit because I think they're not going to be as powerful at making a difference or an impact in the world as they would have been had they gone and made themselves strong and powerful and successful first. So it's a key developmental stage. Entrepreneurship is a, is a real key stage and as we learn about the, um, the steps and the actions and the models and we formalize how to do it, uh, let's encourage our young people to become entrepreneurs and to actualize their own potentials and to make themselves strong first so that they can come, just like in Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero's Journey, they can return, right, and they can bring the elixir and they have it embodied and they, they have, you know, they've made themselves strong and independent and successful and uh, they've gotten to the point where they can give and they can take without guilt and without shame and they understand the trade-offs uh, across all these dimensions. And that's what I've got for you. So reflections, thoughts, comments, Trevor. 
Thank you. I enjoy that. Uh, can I have your book, please? Uh, but don't tell my wife. Uh, uh, yes, you can have it, <laughs> and it'll help you with your wife. <laughs> uh, She'll thank me. I enjoyed the story. Uh, we, yeah, sure. Uh, we, w a business angel, we deal with young companies, young startups, and I like the bit you said, get powerful first. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think there's a, in a, um, a child-centric society that we have now that the kids think it's just there. You know, Larry Elson did it, um, Bill Gates did it. I can be rich now, famous. Yeah. And you can be famous for being famous, for doing nothing. So, so it's a real mix of things. And I like the idea of learning the trade. Mm -hmm. Maybe you call the trade, become the entrepreneur. I don't use entrepreneur myself. Mm -hmm. I don't regard myself as an entrepreneur. People tell me I am. So I'm a bit embarrassed about it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a closet entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> this is a good place. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. This is a good place to come out. <laughs> it's a good, safe place to come so, out. So um, I, I did like, I just wanted to say, I liked the, 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 the grade you talked about. And, and so fortunately, I'm now in a position where I can get involved in uh, helping other businesses and help people grow. But I, d I do want them to learn to walk first. Hi, thank you for that. Um, I haven't quite articulated um, what I'm sort of grappling with, so it's sort of a schmush of those two talks, but I'm just curious about the messages we send out about entrepreneurship and a, like an unanswered concern I have about um, you know, that entrepreneurship and impact and success and how there's a lot of things that I'd call like almost like a fetish, fetishization of entrepreneurship you know, before you're really there. And I guess my concern, like where I'm at, I'm just aware of little advantages that I have and in, in, in my privilege, and I'm wondering how is it that I succeed by, you know, being a man and therefore I have access through having a beer with this person who introduces me to someone else, that um, maybe we're sending these mes messages out to succeed. And I'm just curious, how does, I guess my question is, how do we make entrepreneurship that has social impact not a luxury good? Um, something that everyone can have access to because they don't really know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. Do you want the politically correct answer or do you want what I really think? What do we, what do we want? Okay, good. Um, it really occurs to me that some of us got natural wiring, hard wiring, that the evolutionary psychologist would probably have some correlation and say is heritable that give us an advantage as entrepreneurs. That, that's what I, I believe that. I believe some of us got some gifts and some wiring that make us naturally good at entrepreneurship. And a lot of folks, they're, they got gifts where they're naturally good at some other things that are just as important, right? So some people, when they get into the entrepreneurship world, they're going to, it's going to come a lot easier to them and they're going to thrive more. And for some folks who uh, are really not gifted in other areas, but are very gifted in the entrepreneurship kind of gifts, um, I think that they sometimes hide out there. They go and that becomes their, their place where they can hide from the world and where they can be safe. Um, so for example, several friends that I have are very good in entrepreneurship, but they're not very good in relationship. Yeah, And so it's easy to go hide out in more success and more money to try to buy the things that they think will get relationship rather than develop in relationship. Um, now, that said, whether or not we have the gift, the natural you know, gifts for entrepreneurship, um, I think all of us should still go study it and we should all go figure it out. Um, just like someone that might be naturally highly gifted in entrepreneurship may not be you know, again, for example, highly gifted in empathy and relationship, they should still go learn empathy and relationship and compassion and develop that side of them uh, as well. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. And I think where it gets really exciting is um, where you have the layers of employee to entrepreneur to business owner, mm -hmm. uh, investor, philanthropist, is when we can have a lens of impact throughout that so we don't have to wait till, you know, we're at the end of our lives and we've got a ton of money because we're successful entrepreneurs to give back. But as Matthew was saying, if we're able to instill those threads of social and environmental impact throughout our journey, um, then I think collectively we can be very powerful. 
Yeah, and the internet has changed the game. I mean, it was very recent that no one realized anything that was going on in the world or any of the problems we had. And all of a sudden now we're plugged in and we can all see what's going on and young people are curious and they're interested in the planet. And so, yeah, I mean, we young people can now go and they can, you know, be an employee for a company that's making an impact and we can we can start aligning ourselves from a much younger age. Yeah. Kenny. Yeah, thank you, Evan. Um, I partly became an entrepreneur because I'm basically unemployable. You know, I just don't like working for other people. But yeah. um, having worked and working both in the for-profit and non-profit sector, one of the most striking things to me was that, for example, when I started Seeds of Change and dealt a lot with the media and the press, just the fact that it was a business um, suddenly made biodiversity cool. And people were, you know, had a completely positive orientation because somehow there was some value associated with its being a business. In the nonprofit sector, like with pioneers, you're regarded as a do-gooder, you know. And there's this kind of yes, we'll be charitable towards you because you're trying to do something good in the world, but it actually devalues it. And um, from my perspective, I mean, it's almost irrelevant whether it's commercial or non-commercial. It's the, the real question is the motive, you know, behind that or the mix of motives. And then there's a steady entropic um, process that I've witnessed over the several decades now where businesses that started originally impact investing was just called SRI, socially responsible investing. The, the kind of you know, um, nomenclature du jour keeps shifting, but I don't see a big difference. But most of these companies have been bought up by the majors. I mean, all the independent food companies are no longer independent. The mission, there's tremendous mission drift. And it ultimately ends up mostly about being, you know, making money. So I wonder yeah. if you would comment on that. Yeah, I, you know, you were talking to kind of the esteem of people in a way, um, like their their own self image. I was having a conversation recently. So in the last few years, I've become very interested in art, in visual art, and my wife and I have started collecting a lot of visual art, and I've been getting to know uh, some of what I think of as the best artists who have ever lived, and it's really neat to to plug into these people who are in a t completely different current than I've been involved in and get to know them. And what I've noticed is a consistent, um, most of them are basically starving artists. You know, they paint a few pictures and then they sell a few pictures and they're trying to support their families and trying to make it. Um, and uh, a lot of them, uh, they, they've adopted the money and success is bad kind of thing, and yet they're trying to support themselves. And one of these artists, uh, who I've been getting to know over the last year or so, who have you know skyped with maybe six or eight times or something like that. So we've become friends and we've had some several conversations. Uh, and he's he's one of these you know money's bad. He's he's got that success is bad and those people that have it are kind of bad kind of thing. So I've been working on him trying to get him to realize no no for someone like you money's very good. Like if you had a lot of money this world would get much better because you'd be a good you know steward of it. And we finally had the conversation a few weeks ago. We were talking and he said kind of okay. What's it like? <laughs> you know, like, what's it like to have not had money and then have money? And, uh, you know, and I, and I got to, and, and these are great conversations to have. It was like, it's actually pretty cool, man. Like, it's, you know, come on, you know. Uh, so, unfortunately, a lot of folks who are, um, you know, this is kind of the dark side in a way of the demonizing and projection, but a lot of folks who are, getting involved in contribution because they didn't have a chance to experience success f for themselves first if the temptation comes around later on it's very hard you know to resist or even you don't recognize it you know you don't even know maybe you don't you going through business for a few years you know you get bit you you learn about how you know real hardcore capitalistic kind of people think you get screwed a few times you get hacked on your server like all these things happen and you come back to the world m maybe a little more cynical but more experienced and if you've got a good heart it just makes you better able i think to you know contribute in a lot of ways so yeah i don't know if i answered your question directly but uh, i think i'm with you and i think if we all went through an entrepreneur phase and a, a more independent phase we would be better because if we would start a, an operation and we'd, you know, we'd start a business that we would be growing and it would be making an impact, and instead of, oh, look, there's an offer on the table, I'm going to sell this because I need the money, we would say, no, you know what, I'm going to stay with this because this thing has a mission and we're going to, you know, because I don't, I don't have to.
Cool. Okay, we've got one more question. Yeah. Okay. Um, just wanted to reflect on something that you were saying about the professional journey that we go through, you know, employees and then becoming entrepreneurs and all that. And um, something that occurred to me, uh, I recently went to um, Wanderlust Festival here in New Zealand, which actually was in a very similar sort of dome. And uh, one of the guys, Robbie Pollard, was talking about, Johnny Pollard, was talking about the importance of being centered and aware and conscious yourself before you actually start doing something, you know, um, for others. And, uh, and so it reflected on um, what um, Matthew was saying earlier and Brian, I think, as well. Like, if we talk about Im impact entrepreneurship and the importance of the inner journey as well as with the sort of psychological journey that you talked about, you know, if we want to make sure that um, those, those entrepreneurs actually have an impact that makes sense and they don't get disturbed by their own egos and by other things that sort of um, confuse them on their journey, um, we, we really have to... Um, help them with that spiritual journey as well. And in a way, you know, if you look around here, for a lot of people that are not in the business world, they, they kind of stay away from anything that's slightly, you know, in the, in the spiritual world or in the, um, so, you know, yoga and meditation practice. And the question for me is, like, how do we bring that into the business world? How do we normalize that experience for entrepreneurs? Because I think if we don't do that, um, you know, the, even with the best intentions, the, the impact will not be... Um, you know, uh, you know, something that that's going to help the planet or that's going to help our system. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> How do we do that? I think a, a model that I've learned from Ken Wilber that's starting to move through the culture a little bit. I think that if we could all, if this could become one of the more important models that we all communicate as part of what we do, it could help with that. And that is the idea that to transcend means to include, that when you go beyond something, it doesn't mean to reject where you were at before or to marginalize or demonize it. It means to then use that as a building block for the next level. So for example, in uh, spiritual development, there's, you know, there's a current of the ego is this bad thing. The reality is the ego is just as natural and just as normal as our body or our emotions or our reflexive thinking consciousness, the challenge comes when we become overly identified with the ego exclusively. And what we can do is we can do practices where we can go beyond the ego. Where we can, but that means to transcend it, which means to include it. And it's very counterintuitive for most people to think of building a strong ego in order to transcend the ego. And that's a, it's a little subtle distinction, right? But to, to transcend means to include, to go beyond. So if, if we learn to transcend means to include, and then we learn developmental models that at each level we take what was at the previous level and it becomes a building block that we start using for the next level, um, I think that can help us be more integrated as, uh, as humans and to not take who we were and to continually have the need to demonize that and to make that wrong and bad and to project and do all this kind of shadow, you know, casting on it. Um, yeah, so to transcend means to include, to go beyond. Cool. Final reflection, Matthew. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to say in response to that, too, I want to give a plug for this conference that's happening. Unfortunately, it was happening while we were out here this month, uh, Wisdom 2.0. The, in Silicon Valley, and it's a gathering of hundreds of people who are specifically focused on this question of bringing more mindfulness, uh, yoga practice, meditation into business. And there's folks from Google and Facebook and Medium and all these different companies who are figuring it out. And so they're talking about things like, you know, employee benefits programs that have meditation retreats sponsored as part of the perks. And what does that look like? And how do you institutionalize uh, a more mindfulness-based uh, practice and ritual inside of companies. So uh, Wisdom 2.0, and they put all the talks online. That's great. W one last thought. Um, post hierarchy, going beyond hierarchy, it's post hierarchy. It, and one of the best ways to go beyond hierarchy is to learn entrepreneurship, because you, you have to master hierarchy to really learn the skills of it experientially. And then once you learn it, like anything else, once you learn a rule, that you can then go beyond it. Right? So let's go beyond hierarchy. Let's not make it an evil, bad thing. Let's learn what it is and learn why it happens. And then let's go 
beyond it. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>